be seated in God's wonderful presence. Our God is so good. What a mighty, mighty, mighty God we serve. I'm so excited, so glad to be back in the house of the Lord and knowing that I'm back for a while now. So <laughs> I, I got all the complaints and sometimes threats. <laughs> Hallelujah. Our God is so good. Mr. Michael, God bless you. God bless you, Betty, your entire family. Now, I remember, you know, a few years ago when you had just come, you were coming from, what's that very far place now? Hagerstown. Over an hour away. And yet he'll be in church on time. That's, that's, that's commendable. Please clap. Especially those of you who live five minutes away. I tell your neighbor he's back. <laughs> but to come from Hagerstown and be in church on time is commendable. Yes, As a heart who's desperate and yearning for God. And since then, they're closer now. He's just been one who serves the Lord. And if you didn't tell me, I won't know you were 50. I'm, I'm praying for, for that grace. Amen. God bless you. Happy, happy, happy birthday. He turned 50 on Friday. 50 represents Jubilee. And what Jubilee signifies is, you know, seven is, is the number of perfection. Seven is, is Sabbath. And so 50, you have seven sevens. And, and you know, the, the Jewish tradition, when, when you turn 50, every debt that you owed is forgiven. Amen. Mr. Michael, I pray that same blessing over you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. And the Lord will give you liberty. Amen. The Lord will liberate you Amen. in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. No burden upon you. All that you owe, all that you've been doing in your works, in your strength. I pray the grace of God over you in the name of Jesus. Not by might, not by power, but by the spirit of God. And every mountain that is before you, you will bring down with capstones and shouts of grace. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 On Friday also, it was our wonderful music director's birthday, Minister Wilson Joel. Amen. God bless you, Minister Wilson. Um, you know, some, some people are just blessed. He's such an amazing, amazing, amazing man of God. I don't say this too, too much. I'm not one for platitudes, but he's actually one of my closest friends. But people would not know. Because in church and everywhere else, he honors me as his pastor. Doesn't matter what else happens outside. Very, very few know how to balance that relationship. Minister Wilson, I love you so much. Happy birthday. God honor you the way you've honored me in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Most importantly, I love the, 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 the praise team. I see the confidence. I see the glow. I see the grace. You know, now you guys are just playing and enjoying yourselves. I love it. Um, but it's because of, of, of the, the coordination and the arrangement. So, Mr. Wilson, thank you. Keep, keep leading that team to glorious, glorious heights. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Actually, lots of celebrations. On Friday, in my family, we're celebrating Pastor Tim's dad, who turned 80. <laughs> amazing, amazing, amazing man of God. Classic gentleman. If you think Pastor Tim is cool, wait till you meet the OG. Um, <laughs> just a cool dude, you know, still doing 25 push-ups at age 80. I don't know how. As we have it on video. I'm not exaggerating. The last one they caught was at 76, where he did 26 push-ups. Now he's brought it down by one. Just 
an amazing, amazing man. Um, I celebrate with you, Pastor Tim and the Love for Marking family. God bless you and honor you. Amen. And today also happens to be the OAS 12th year wedding anniversary. I don't know if you saw when they came in, Johnson held grace like that. <laughs> He held grace. I preached a message a few months ago, and Johnson said, Pity, you said we should embrace grace. So I'm going to go home and embrace grace. I said as well, continue. <laughs> Mr. Michael's miracle is about to happen to you. <laughs> and he said, Somehow she conceived again. <laughs> <laughs> 12 years apart, so 12 years, you guys should, somehow, <laughs> somehow, somehow, amen, <laughs> all right, let me preach, you guys play too much, amen, hallelujah, I want to preach and start a series this morning, where we're going to be looking into the life of Joseph, uh, Joseph's, Joseph's journey is, is really just a a, a, a portrait to everything that signifies the completed work of Jesus Christ. Joseph is, is a prototype of Jesus. Um, you've heard me say it before, and, and I'm going to place an even stronger emphasis on it, that the entire Bible, all of Scripture, is talking about one man, and his name is Jesus. And so the Old Testament is the New Testament concealed, and the New Testament is the Old Testament revealed. Everything, the entirety of scripture is talking about Jesus. So Leviticus calls him the priest. Ruth calls him Kingsman Redeemer. Isaiah says he's the lamb upon the throne. All of scripture is talking about Jesus. New Testament, we see it in an easier way. But I need you to see that. Joseph especially is such a, 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 almost an archetype really of Jesus. Joseph, the Bible says, was beloved by his father. And I'll get there in a minute. His father loved him and gave him a coat of many colors. Jesus, the Bible says, the heavens open. And Jesus said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Joseph, we know, was rejected by his brothers, the ones who, who should love him, who should have loved him. Jesus was rejected by his people. And he would say that the prophet is without honor in his hometown. And we see all these examples. Joseph was sold for 20 pieces of silver. Jesus was sold for 30 pieces of silver. Joseph was falsely accused by Potiphar's wife. Jesus was accused. So much so that they said, give us Barnabas. Give us the one that we know is, is a thief. The one we know is a murderer. Give us. That's the one we want. Take Jesus, accused for no reason. Joseph falsely suffered and was imprisoned for something he didn't do. And same with Jesus. Joseph would eventually reconcile with his brothers and say, it's okay. You might have meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. Jesus will say the same thing on the cross. Father, forgive them for they know what they're doing. For they don't know what they're doing. And we see all these parallels. Joseph eventually will serve as, as, as a savior, really, for his family, his kin, that they would go to a far place to seek bread. Jesus is our ultimate savior. I'm saying that to say that I want you to see all the parallels. So every time I'm talking about Joseph, really I'm talking about Jesus. That Joseph's story is not so much about Joseph, it's about Jesus. And so we're going to be looking at his journey. A portrait of Christ's complete work. There are four major stages. I'll touch on some other ones, but four major ones. And you know them as you matriculated through Bible school in your earlier years. That Joseph was in the pit, and from there, he was sold as a slave to Potiphar's house. And then Potiphar's house, as, as, as the thoughts that she was, tried to sleep with him. And he said, and he said, okay, you guys are paying attention. 
And she said, if you don't know what the thought is, that's fine. Just, yeah, yeah, the really saved one. Keep looking forward. And Joseph said, I can't sin against God. I can't sin against God. And he's running and the coat that he's been given, she strips it off of him. And so we see his brothers strip the coats. Potiphar's wife strips the coats. And then later on, we're going to see when it's placed on him. And then from there, he goes to prison before he ascends to the throne. This is part one. So I'm kind of laying a foundation for all of it. But today, I want to focus on that first part. When life throws you in a pit. Because sometimes, that's what happens. Most times, you're not expecting it. Most times, as a matter of fact, is it, it, it almost looks as though things are going good. Can you imagine Joseph just enjoying himself? Joseph comes and tells his family, I had a dream. I had a dream that all the sheaves were bowing down to me. His brothers were upset. And they talked about him. I love what the Bible says. The Bible says that Joseph had another dream. Saints, if you let what people are saying crush your dream, then you really, really are not listening to God. You had the dream. They didn't. The Bible says that Joseph had another dream. And they said, look, MLK is coming. No, look, this dreamer is coming. But Joseph didn't, didn't mind. He said, I had another dream. And guess what? This time, the sun, the moon, everyone was bowing down to me. And they were upset. You know the story. And very, very soon after, he lands in a pit. And sometimes that's how life is. Sometimes that's what happens where you are wondering, how in the world did I get to this place? Do you remember David in the cave of Adullam? David, the Bible says, no, excuse me, not Adullam, in Ziklag, 1 Samuel 30. David had gone with his people to raid. And the Bible talks about how the Amalekites came to raid. And the Amalekites is the spirit that attacks the weak. They attack women, they attack children. And the Bible says that they took everything that David had. Everything. And the Bible is so descriptive. I love it so much. Because the Bible says that all scripture is inspired by God. It wasn't so much that it said they took everything. It says, and they took David's two wives. Just in case you missed that everything. You know how you have that prized possession? There's, there's, you can take everything and then you can take David's two wives. And David was not playing with his two wives. There are some times where you can take everything. And there are some things that you can lose. But there's one way when, when it goes. You are like, what in the world is happening? And sometimes that's how life is. You who used to be the life of the party. Now we can't even hear your voice. Something has been taken. You don't have to have two wives for something to be taken away from you. Let me quickly modernize so you, you realize what it is. It says that everything was taken. Go back to my text, Joseph. His brothers were upset that the father showed him favor. He was, he was the chosen one. He was everything that they said was about Joseph. If I'm chosen times three, who are you as a person? <laughs> it, would be, it would be Joseph. Everything was about him. Everything was, was, was that he was loved. But Joseph ends up in a pit somehow. And saints, even in the deepest and the darkest places, hear me out please. Because all of my message is premised on this. That in the deepest, the darkest places, God is present and God is working. And so what looks like a pit is definitely not permanent. Is simply preparation for the next place that God has you. you. Know what I've realized? Every now and then it appears as though you've been buried. But being buried and being planted, they look the same. You can't see anything that's happening. You can't see anything that's going on. And so sometimes when it looks as though you've been buried, you've really just been planted. God is still working in you. God is still doing something in you. God is teaching you. He's showing you. So here we see Joseph, Genesis 37. Genesis 37. His brothers conspire against him. And they betray him. They said when they saw him afar off, they conspired against him to kill him. 
These are his brothers, saints. Ten older brothers to be exact. And sometimes when life throws you in a pit, it throws you into a pit of betrayal. But you know what I've realized about betrayal? Betrayal can only happen from someone close to you. There are some people when they do stuff, they're like, <laughs> it doesn't matter. Like, I don't like you, you don't like me. It's, it's not even that I don't like you. It's, I really don't have an opinion about you. Like, I've not thought about you enough to like you or not like you. I don't know if that makes sense. And then there are some people that you know those ones are close. That when they do something, you have to say, okay, hold up. What just happened? Bible says they conspired. It was, it was premeditated. They, they said, you know what? How are we going to kill Joseph? What was his crime? That his father loved him. What was his crime? That he had a dream. Why is that a problem? Why can't you have your own dream? If I tell you I have a dream, why does that upset you? Go sleep and have a dream. Bible says they conspired against him to kill him. And you know the story. They said, let's, 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 let's take him. Same, like I said, with Jesus. How does, does Judas, someone who you've been with the Savior, you've been with Jesus, who's perfect, who's holy, for three years, how do you conspire to say, I'm going to sell him? And I realize that is so that the word might be fulfilled. Because at Passover, Passover, Jesus says, that which you will do, do it quickly. It has to happen. I know we don't like it. I know you think, man, that's, that, was, that, was, that was my guy. We, we were college roommates. We were this. We were that. We were that. Life happens. And then you find yourself in this pit of betrayal. What do you do? You can only rest on God. Why? God is the one who says, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. When life throws you into this pit, this, this pit of betrayal, many times it brings about brokenness. Because the, 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 the pit we don't hear about. But if I could, if, if, if I could just ask Joseph, what, what are you thinking in that place? What are you thinking in the pit? How did I get here? My brothers put me here. My brothers threw me here. You are wondering what in the world is going on. And sometimes we find ourselves in this place. We find ourselves in this pit. And I want to ask you this morning, what is your pit? It could be financial. It could be a relationship. It could be, it could be, could be marital. Whatever it is. What is it that you are thinking? How in the world did I get here? Because life has a way of putting us in low places. Where you feel totally despondent. And you feel, you feel just destitute and forlorn and, and in debt. You don't know what is going on. And you're wondering how in the world am I going to make it out of here? How in the world am I, am I going to get out of this place? He's in a pit. And in the place of the pit is where you don't, you don't know what is going to happen. I mentioned David in the cave of Adullam earlier. The Bible says that everyone who was broke, everyone who was destitute, everyone who had nothing, they came to stay with David. When you are a king, you are not looking for broke people. But that's what happens in that place, in the pit. It looks like nothing is happening there. But that's where God builds us up. That's where God teaches us. That's where character is formed. Bible says that in, in a very pres God is a very present help in the time of trouble. Joseph, later on, will be able to forgive his brothers. And say what you meant for evil, God meant it for good. You know why? He had been in the pit before. That's where you learn. And saints, I'm begging you, I know I'm fast forwarding to probably to like part three or part four, but it's okay. There are some things that God cannot do in your life as long as you have bitterness in you. You are carrying a burden that God is saying, this is the blessing. But your whole mindset is I'm going to show them. And so even when you are succeeding, you don't realize it. Why? Because that person has not seen it. Because that person does not know yet. 
Joseph had been in that place where he's in the pit. And in the pit, all you have is God. All you have is the presence of God. And we will see all through scripture, everywhere Joseph went, Bible said the Lord was with him. 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 In prison, the Lord was with him. In Potiphar's house, the Lord was with him. Guess what? In the pit, the Lord was with him. The Lord was with him. No matter where you are today, I want you to realize that in the pit, God is with you. And that your past cannot determine your future. God's calling does. And if there's anything I know about God is that God doesn't call the equipped. God doesn't call the strong. God doesn't call the perfected ones. No, he calls you and then he perfects you. He calls you and then his grace is what carries you all the way. He's teaching you in that place. Joseph was in the pit, but God's presence was with him. Bible says in Psalm 138, 39, excuse me, says, where can I go from here? Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? Please, I beg you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord's presence is in you and with you. Now we carry God. In the Old Testament, you'll see a lot of the Lord is with you. Or the Lord was with me. But now we realize with Jesus that you're a carrier of grace. That greater is on the inside of you than he that is in the world. So everywhere you go, the presence of God surely is in you, is with you. Joseph had to have what I call a pit stop. You know what is interesting about pit stops? It looks like nothing is happening. It looks like you have to stop. The race is going. It's shown back then that we used to talk because he loves car racing. I can't sit down in front of a TV and watch cars just zoom for one hour. Makes no sense to me, but he loves it. <laughs> <laughs> and he's always telling me what car this is and what this one does and what that does but it's amazing how I was researching for my message that in 10 seconds sometimes less they can change four tires and refuel but you need to do this or else you're going to stop in a place where you don't want to stop so God has some planned pit stops for us. And you may not like it, but it's planned. It's in the journey. If you are taking a long road trip, you, it's, it's okay the way you can plan. I'm going to stop here for rest. Bathroom break. Because if you ever drive with young kids, it's like they've timed it. 15 minutes into the journey, I'm like, absolutely not. I asked everybody. <laughs> To use the bathroom before we left. But this one you can plan. And God says it's time to stop here. And to wait for a little bit. David, I know you've been anointed king. But I'm going to give you a pit stop in Adolam. It doesn't look like what you've been told. Joseph, I know you had a dream. You had a second dream. But you find yourself in a pit. And sometimes, most times, our issue is, Lord, what you promised me does not look like my current reality. But if you can just trust God and stay in the place where you're saying, Lord, I know this pit stop. What, what looks like is bad, I know is ordained by God. I know God brought me here for a reason. I know God has something to do with this. And when that happens, what always happens is that you start praising God. Gratitude always changes your perspective. It's like, Lord, I thank you for where I am right now. I thank you that I may not be where I'm trying to get to, but guess what? I'm not where I used to be. Lord, I thank you for always providing for me. Lord, I thank you. You know why that is important? Because whilst... Joseph was in the pits. Remember, this, they, it starts out saying they conspired to kill him. Bible says that Judah said, why are we going to kill him? Why are we going to kill him? Let's, let's bring him out and let's sell him. You know what is so important about that? It's okay, you might have missed it. Judah is after the tribe and the lineage of Jesus. Judah, we call Jesus the lion of the tribe of Judah. Judah 
is great, 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 great grandfather of Jesus. And so when I say Judah lifted Joseph out of the pit, guess what? Praise lifted him out of the pit. There's a praise that it doesn't matter when you're in a bad place, you're in a dark place, you're, you're in a place where you're like, Lord, what is going on? But you're saying, Lord, I'm still going to praise you. I'm still going to glorify you. David, I was referencing earlier in Ziklag. The Bible says that when he saw everything, it says him and the men who were with him. The Bible says they cried and they had no more strength to weep. I don't know if you've ever been there before. It's a really bad place. If you've not, that is fine. You know how sometimes you can cry some good tears? And the other day, my, my oldest was asking me, Daddy, did you cry when I was born? I said, yes. And she got a tickle out of it. It's like, really? Describe it for me. I'm like, uh, am I supposed to cry again? Like, <laughs> like I don't get it. So I'm like, no. I'm like, I shed some, you know, thug tears. You know how there's, there's the cute one, you know? I was overwhelmed. <laughs> And then there are the tears where snot is flying all over the place. Like you can't, you can't compose yourself. Like when you finish crying, you feel like, yes, I've worked hard. That's the kind of tears David was in. Those are some of the tears where when you get to, but you know what I loved so much. The Bible says that after David had cried, said, bring me the effort. I'm going to pray and I'm going to praise and I'm going to see what God is saying. Isaiah 54, it says, sing, O barren. Sing, O barren. There are some times where you're in the pit of barrenness that nothing is working. And you almost begin to doubt. Did God really say? Did God tell me? Did God say I should go with this business? God, I thought you said. And you're in that pit. You're confused. But if you can just get yourself to the place where you can say, God, I worship you. Thank you. Evangelist Shirley Caesar said, you may not know how, you may not know when, but God will do it again. God will do it again. He's not stopped blessing people. There's a praise that begins to emanate. What praise does is it takes your focus away from the problem and it puts it solely on God. It doesn't say the problem is not there. It just says, Lord, I'm focusing on you. I'm focusing on you. Why? You're the only one that can deliver me. You're the only one that can bring me out of this pit anyway. Judah says we can't kill him. Let's bring him out. Let's bring him out. Let's bring him out. Praise lifted him. Praise brought out Paul when they were in prison in a dark place. In a destitute place, in a damp place, when they were in a pit, Paul and Silas in Acts 16, Bible says that about midnight, at midnight, you know midnight scientifically is the darkest hour of the day. At midnight, you're not sure what is going to happen. You are like, Lord, why is this happening? But my Bible says that they were praying and they were singing hymns to God. And please, I beg you, don't read this text anachronistically. Don't read it and not factor in time. Because we can read it now. But realize that these guys had just been flogged. These guys are probably at this point starving. Prison is cold. All for what? Because they were preaching the gospel. And at night time, as opposed to complaining, Bible says that they were praying and singing. And you have a problem when you're asked to do something. Oh, the church is using me too much. And then some people, oh, the church doesn't use me enough. But these guys, all they wanted to do is, Lord, I thank you. Lord, I thank you. But it's like, I count it worthy. To be persecuted for the gospel. They were praying. And they were singing. Bible says that at midnight. The prison doors were open. Saying something happens. When you start praising. Something happens. When you start glorifying God. And if I could say it well. The way God told me. Is that your deliverance is in your praise. Your deliverance is in your shout. Your deliverance is in when you say, Lord, I praise you. Lord, I thank you. Lord, I glorify you. Psalm 46. It says that at the dawn, at the, at the very dawn, God will help her. Right, right before time. 
says, why are you disquieting within me, O my soul? Sometimes you have to preach to yourself. Psalmist was saying, why are you quiet in me? Hope in God. Hope in God. I know it doesn't look good right now, but you cannot afford to be quiet. You cannot afford to be silent. Psalm is preaching to, to himself or herself. You have to. Says why at the very dawn, right, right at, the, at, the, at the time, says God will come through for her. My Bible says that weeping may endure for a night, but joy is coming in the morning. I don't know if there's anyone here who has a pit stop praise. Where you're like, Lord, I know I'm in the pit, but I'm still going to bless you. I'm still going to glorify you. You know why I'm staying on this so much? Is that now we have this Western Christianity. That when God loves you, everything is supposed to go smoothly. And at the first sign of trouble, we think is the absence of God. Absolutely not. Trouble is not the absence of God. I dare say that for many, trouble is the presence of God. Because it means you are doing exactly what God wants you to do. And there's opposition. But you can say in whatever situation you are in, Lord, I'm still going to praise you anyway. Like Job, Job 19, you can say, even if he slays me, yet will I praise him. It's a determination that you've made up in your heart. Saints, when life throws you in a pit, your response is praise. Praise and worship to God. Not because of what God has done, but because of who he is. If you only praise God when he's done something, then you might not be able to praise every time. You have to get to the place like the Israelites were in the desert. Bible says that they wrote a song and they were praising the Lord God Almighty. Second Chronicles 20. Let me illustrate quickly with this and go. Jehoshaphat's army. You know the story. Bible says when he consulted with the people, he appointed those who should sing to the Lord and those who should praise the beauty of holiness as they went out before the army and were saying, praise be to God for his mercy endures forever. I love this so much. The Bible says that this battle, they didn't have to use a sword. They didn't have to use a gun. They didn't have to use anything. Praise is, is not just what we are saying to God. Praise is a weapon if you would realize that, you can start praising God. And you can start blessing God. And say, Lord, I praise you. In the bad times, in the good times, I'm still going to praise you. Psalm 34 says, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. I beg you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, do like Jehoshaphat. When you are faced with certain ba battles, it's not time to fight back. It's not time to talk back. It's not time to beg. Joseph didn't explain. He didn't say, I'm sorry. He didn't say, why are you guys saying this about me? He didn't say anything. All he did was wait on God. I tell you, he was praising in the pit because why? Praise lifted him. Praise is your only response when you're in that pit, when you're in that place, that it looks like nothing is happening. Genesis 49 verse 8. Judah again is prophesied to lead his brothers. Judah, you are he whom your brothers shall praise. Praise is the one whom his brothers shall praise. It's okay, I used to be slow too. Let me say it another way. Judah represents praise. And so God is saying, in praise, you will be praised. In praise, you will be exalted. Psalm 22, it says that if I be exalted, I will draw all men unto me. Judah, representing praise. You're the one whom your brothers shall praise. It says your hand shall be on the neck of your enemies. Praise is your greatest weapon. Your father's children shall bow before you. I don't have to fight anyone. I don't have to say anything. All I'm doing is praising God. It's worshiping God. It's blessing God. And sometimes you think you are in trouble. Sometimes you think, Lord, what is going on here? You think there's trouble when the enemy makes you capitulate and kneel down. But saints, can I tell you that you are not kneeling down in surrender. You are kneeling down in worship of the King of Kings. You are kneeling down in praise of a God who has done everything. Judah, the hand of Judah 
will be on the neck of your enemies. I love it so much. Deliverance is coming at the right time. Saints, God has a plan for you. Help me tell your neighbor, God has a plan for you. Yeah, 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 yeah. God has a plan for you. You have to be able to believe that. You have to be able to trust that. Judah is praising God. Joseph, you're not going to die in the pit. Right when it looked like he was about to be forgotten. Bible says that traders are coming. And Joseph gets sold. Saints, look at the master plan of God. I love it. The providence of God. God is such a master plan. It, it astounds me. Joseph, you are having a dream of people bowing down to you. But how else would Joseph get to Egypt? How else would Joseph ascend to the throne? God has planned everything. The guys that are trading, God tells them exactly when they need to be going on their journey. That you don't know it yet, but you're about to buy and make your best investment. You're about to buy this slave that is not a regular slave. You're about to buy this slave that eventually will turn out to be your deliverer. And so Joseph is sold to slavery instead of dying in a pit. And even though the situation looked hard and, and, and it looked like it was getting worse, what I like so much is that he wasn't left to die. Ecclesiastes says that as long as there is life, there is hope. As long as there is life, there is hope. The fact that you are here lets me know you're, you're a victor. The fact that you are here lets me know you're a conqueror. Let's me know that you've, you've been bought by the blood of Jesus. And so we are always fighting from victory, not for victory. It lets me know that you are victorious, that there's life in you. You may not know how, but if you can trust God. And Romans 8, 28 is working together for us. It's working together. Goodbye, I'm finished. It's, it's making it happen. Now God says that we know that all things work together for our good. Joseph, you may not understand why your brothers have betrayed you. You may not understand why it looks like the very people who should love you don't love you. You may not understand why all these things are happening right now. And what you are calling rejection, the Spirit of God is saying, I should tell you, he's calling redirection. So you tried this door, it didn't open. It's okay. God is saying, I'm redirecting you to this one. Because if you went inside this door, guess what? You're not going to go to the door that I have for you. I'll never forget when God told me that I should praise God for everything that I asked for that didn't happen. If you understand that blessing, there's a blessing behind closed doors. There are some things that you should be thankful to God for. There are some things that you should say, Lord, I thank you that it didn't happen. It's okay, we're in church now. But when you get home and you're by yourself, thank God for every ex. I say, Lord, I thank you. I don't need to preach it, continue. <laughs> Lord, I thank you for every job that rejected me. I thank you for everything that didn't happen. Why? Because it was bringing me to the very place that you have for me right now. That every experience, everything, the good, the bad, the ugly, God was working it out for your good. God was directing you. God was leading you and bringing you to a perfect place. And so Joseph, I know you're in the pit right now and I don't want to go too far into message two. I want to stay in that place. Because sometimes that's what happens. It looks like you're enjoying life. Joseph is having fun. Life is Gucci. Coat of many colors. He's looking good. And then all of a sudden, that good life, that soft life comes to a screeching halt. Yesterday, I was my father's favorite son. Today, I'm in the pit. Shall we rise? Life doesn't give a warning. You think it's going very well. I like this place. Why? Because most times, everything that we begin to idolize, God has a way of taking it. So you refocus on him. You think if Joseph had 
a straight linear life. A, he doesn't make the throne. B, most especially, he can never get to the place of understanding to forgive his brothers. He can never make that powerful statement to say what you meant for evil. Your intentions were bad. I'm not disputing that. But God turned it around for good. Isn't that what Jesus has done for all of us? That's the reconciliation that Jesus gives us. The redemption. And so I want to invite you to invite God into your pit seasons. And if you're not in a pit season right now, that's fine. Preaching 101 is that everyone you're preaching to is in different phases of life. Life is all great and dandy for you right now. That's good. Pray for us and help your brother and your sister. But I know that there are some people in the pit right now. Right now. And you cried yourself to sleep last night. God is saying, I'm there with you. I'm there with you. I'm there with you. Erroneously, we've been taught that deliverance is when God takes you out of a problem. But can I suggest to you that a greater deliverance is when God keeps you and stays with you in the problem. Yes, Joseph was brought out of the pit, but can we talk about that time where Joseph is in the pit? Yes, those, those Hebrew boys were thrown in the fire and they were brought out and we love it. Bible says the smell of smoke was not even on them. But how about the fact that they were in the fire? And the Bible says even the king who was not a believer says I see a fourth man whose appearance is as that of the son of God. When God is with you people that don't believe God they will see it and they would acknowledge that God is with you. Genesis 39, we don't have to get there today. It was Potiphar that said the Lord is with Joseph. The Lord is with Joseph. And that's what I want you to take away from this. The presence of God. The presence of God. Lift up your hands. Let's pray. The presence of God. If you're in a dark place right now, in a lonely place, even whilst married and someone lying beside you, you still feel lonely and destitute. God is with you. God is with you. God says, come unto me. All you who are heavy burdened. Matthew 11. Says, my yoke is easy. And my burden is light. Jesus. Jesus. Spirit of the living God. Spirit of the living God. God is building your character inside the pit. 
He's building patience, the fruit of the Spirit. Love being manifested as patience. Fruit of the Spirit, love being manifested as long-suffering. You're like, Lord, why am I in the pit? I did everything right. And it looks as if people are taking shortcuts. But it's just a pit stop arranged by God. For you to be refreshed. Second Samuel 23, I want us to pray. There's a wonderful gentleman in scripture. You may not have heard of him. He doesn't get talked about a lot. But Benaiah is such a, an amazing hero of faith. I believe there was a time I preached about unexpected or unlikely heroes. And he was one of the characters I highlighted. Second Samuel 23. The Bible says Benaiah was the son of Jehoda. The son of a valiant man from Kabzil. Says he had done many deeds. His father. But here's what Benaiah had done. Bible says he had killed two lion-like heroes of Moab. But here's the one I like so much. It says he had gone down and killed a lion in the midst of a snowy pit. And I know you're never going to have to fight a lion physically. That's good. But he went down to the pit to do this. If you read further down verse 24 27 there about bible talks about how he became on the king's guard david is like i like this guy i like this guy come and be my chief security because if you can run down to the pit while other people are running away you went to the pit saints there are some things of greatness that the only way to get there is through that problem. David, you can be anointed with oil as much as you want. The way you ascend that throne is through Goliath. Joseph, the way you get to the throne is through the pit. And we'll look at some of the other character tests later. Now sometimes you might be the one to say, you know what, this is it. This is it. Like Jesus. Jesus said, I have to go to the cross. I have to. Even in the garden of Gethsemane, yes. Lord, if this cup can pass away from me, but nevertheless, your will be done. Let's stop looking for the easy way. And let's start looking for the godly way. Because Proverbs says there's a way that seems right to man, but his end thereof is of destruction. If we would just follow God. Thank you, Pastor Danny, last week. If you're going to be led by God, you have to allow God to lead. Lord, lead us, oh God. Whatever pit we're in. Why? Because the pit is temporary. It's temporary. It's not permanent. It's temporary. It's temporary. Father, we bless your holy name. We're going to worship God just for a few minutes. And I want you to worship that is between you and God. Spirit of God don't just sing a song I want you to worship him we're going to bless the name of Jesus and thank him thank you Spirit of the living God Worship is bringing us out of the pit.
they sold Joseph to the Ishmaelites. And Ishmaelites, if you haven't put it together already, are descendants of Ishmael. That which looked like a mistake, God used to deliver Joseph. That which looked like should have never happened, that's what God used. What you think is your greatest mistake is exactly what God will use to bless you. That parallel is all through scripture. That the stones that the builders rejected, they said this one is not good. That's what has become the chief cornerstone. The Ishmaelites that they were the problem. Always in contention with Isaac. That's who would carry and transport Joseph to exactly where he was going. Let me end. Verse 33. They had to tell Jacob what happened. And how many of you know, like they say, the cover up is always worse than the crime. Verse 33. You know the story. They took Joseph's coat, they poured blood on it, and they brought it. Starts from verse 32. They sent the tunic of many colors and they brought it to their father and said, We have found this. this terrible lies. Do you know whether it is your son's tunic or not? The Bible says, And he recognized it and said, It is my son's tunic. A wild beast has devoured him. Without doubt, Joseph is torn to pieces. I needed to see these words without doubt. Bible says then Jacob tore his clothes, put sackcloth on his waist, and mourned for his son for many days. And all his sons and all his daughters arose to comfort him, but he refused to be comforted. And he said, For I shall go down into the grave to my son in mourning. Thus his father wept for him. How many of us know that? That wasn't true. That that wasn't true. God told me to tell you this morning a prophetic word. God will prove them wrong. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. I wish someone would hear that strongly in their spirit. God is going to prove them wrong. That was Jacob's reality. Or at least perception of his reality. And sometimes perception is reality. He said, I will surely go down. Previous verses, he said, without doubt, I'm so sure. This bloody coat lets me know that Joseph is dead. There are some things sometimes that you're worried about so much and you think it's over. But since it's not over, this is not the last chapter. There's a reason why God says Jesus, Hebrews 12, is the author and the finisher of our faith. He's still writing your story. God proved them wrong. Thank you, Spirit of the living God. Lord, bless your word, O oh God. And whoever that word of knowledge is for, we receive it. Romans says, whose report would we believe? We choose to believe the report of the Lord. It doesn't matter what the facts say. It doesn't matter that there's evidence of a bloody coat. I choose to stand on the truth of God's word, knowing that the truth supersedes facts and we rest in God in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ Amen Amen Hallelujah 
Hallelujah. You may be seated. Amen. God bless you.